Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Ed Jurechin, the director of the Baker Institute, and we want to warmly welcome you to <coughs> this uh, conference on the geopolitics of natural gas. We are very honored to have uh, Minister Khalil, His Excellency from Algeria, and Minister Atia uh, from Qatar on our uh, digital video uh, screen. Uh, it's now my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the honorary chair of the Baker Institute, Mr. James A. Baker III. Uh, I need not go into any lengthy introduction of who he is, former Secretary of State, former Secretary of Treasury, Chief of Staff of the White House, and uh, Presidential Envoy, et cetera. It's an honor for me to present James A. Baker III to the podium. <coughs> Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Ambassador, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning to what we think is a very, very special event. Uh, this conference marks the culmination of a multi-year effort by the Baker Institute and Stanford's Program on Energy and Sustainable Development. The subject, the geopolitics of natural gas, could not be more timely nor more important. You have a busy two days ahead of you, so I promise that my remarks will be brief. Let me begin by extending a very special welcome uh, to our many foreign visitors, particularly to His Excellency Abdullah bin Hamid al Atiyah, Minister of Energy and Industry of the State of Qatar, uh, and His uh, Excellency Shakib Khalil, Minister of Energy and Mines of the Democratic People's Republic of Algeria. Minister Atiyah will be joining us shortly by satellite link up, and Minister Khalil will be speaking here later today. Their participation in this conference is a very, very special honor for all of us. Last July, uh, Alan Greenspan used testimony before the Congress to stress the importance of increasing America's imports of natural gas. If North American natural gas markets are to function with the flexibility exhibited by oil, Chairman Greenspan said, then unlimited access to the vast world reserves of gas is going to be required. While his comments caused headlines here in the United States, uh, the Chairman's point, I think, was not news to those here and abroad who closely follow energy markets. That's because natural gas is playing an ever more central part in the United States and global economies. Its advantages uh, as an efficient, plentiful, and relatively clean energy source are well known to all of you. And they've made natural gas in many ways the fuel of choice, not just in developed countries, but in developing countries as well. In particular, uh, the role of natural gas and electric power generation is steadily increasing and expanding. Global consumption of natural gas is expected by the experts to double over the next three decades, rising to over a quarter, 20, over 25 percent of total primary energy use. Indeed, natural gas will likely surpass coal as a fuel by 2030, making it the second most important source of energy after oil. Advances in discovery and production and transportation have led to what some have called the natural gas revolution. In particular, progress in LNG technology has raised the possibility of a truly global gas market, much like the one that now exists for petroleum. Expanded use of LNG, however, raises in turn a whole series of questions related to security and centering primarily, as we know, on the vulnerability of LNG facilities to potential terrorist attack. Significant financial, regulatory, and political factors complicate efforts to fully tap the world's natural gas reserves. While plentiful, those reserves are often times very remote from world markets, and they are held by a relatively few countries, notably Russia, Iran, Gutter, Algeria. This raises, at least in theory, the possibility of a gas producer's cartel along the lines of OPEC. At a minimum, the rising importance of natural gas in the world economy will place a premium on constructive dialogue between producing and consuming countries, as well as closer cooperation among consuming countries themselves. 
Over the course of today and tomorrow, a broad range of experts will address these and other factors shaping the future of natural gas markets. The subject is vast, and so, ladies and gentlemen, are the ramifications in terms of economics and in terms of geopolitics. From the United States' perspective, the development of natural gas markets will have an important and perhaps even decisive impact on our future growth and on energy security. The subject is no less important from a global standpoint, not least for the over one billion people around the world who today have no dependable access to electricity. Conference participants will include government officials, scholarly experts, and industry observers from both gas exporting and gas consuming countries. They represent the very best minds on the subject of natural gas today, and we are immensely grateful that they've been able to join this conference. Our goal, ladies and gentlemen, is to have as informative and open and transparent a discussion as possible. The next two days are an opportunity to share views, to reassess positions, to stake out common ground. And we hope very much that you and the audience will take as active a role as possible. Now, conferences such as this are, are above all the result of collaboration. And I would like to thank our many sponsors for their unstinting generosity that permits us to put this conference on. We owe a debt of gratitude to British Petroleum, uh, to the Honorable and Mrs. Hushang Ansari, to Shell Exploration and Production, to Baker Botts, to the Electrical Power Research Institute, and to all of the members, member countries, member companies, I'm sorry, of the Baker Institute Energy Forum. We also owe a special thanks to the Institute's Amy Jaffe and to Stanford's David Victor, co-heads of this project, for launching this huge venture over two years ago. The team of researchers that they have assembled is absolutely first rate, and the next two days will rightfully showcase their path-breaking case studies and economic models. Not least, I would like to recognize Amy and David's staffs because they have done the lion's share of the work behind the scenes to make this conference a reality. Let me close these brief remarks by urging that you take a dispassionate and long-term view of the subjects that you're going to address during this conference. In the United States, high energy prices have become, as we all know, a very hot political issue. And the continued unsettled situation in the Middle East has once again pushed energy security to the forefront of our national debate. But we should remember that these problems are not amenable to quick or easy fixes. This conference, of course, promises neither. But it does, I believe, offer something more important, an informed and objective assessment of the challenges that we must face and overcome if we are to supply the world with the energy it requires for a more abundant and secure and environmentally sound future. Thank you all very much for being here. I know we'll have a good conference. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Baker. It is now my privilege to introduce our next speaker, his Excellency Abdullah bin Hamid al Atiyah, the Minister of Energy and Industry of the State of Qatar. He is also the second Deputy Prime Minister of the State of Qatar. He previously served as Minister of Energy, Industry, Water and Electricity, as well as Director of the Qatar Petroleum Company. He represented the Directors of Board of Gulf Airways, and he serves on a number of uh, important boards and uh, commercial uh, uh, endeavors. Uh, the minister served as director of the Office of the Minister of Interior, 
in 18, 1989 to 1992, the office of the Minister of Finance and Petroleum, and he began his career in the office of the Minister of Finance and Petroleum. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Alexandria in Egypt. He is a uh, frequent flyer in terms of the uh, Baker Institute. He has been to the Baker Institute uh, in, in the past, and we've been privileged to uh, share his wisdom on <coughs> the issues of energy in the Middle East and globally. So it's our distinct pleasure to welcome you, Mr. Minister, on our video conference screen. Welcome. Secretary Baker, uh, Ambassador Ed, Georgian, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. It's unfortunate that I am uh, unable to be with you in the person today. Once again, we have to thank technology for bridging distance and time, making, making it possible to address you through this satellite link. Nature of its own reasons and wisdom placed most of the world's hydrocarbon reserves that we know today. In the areas of the early civilization, demand for these resources today is mostly in the areas of the newer civilization which happen to be some distance away. Crude oil was easier to move to consumption centers. This made it a major contributor in fueling the industrial rev revolution and development throughout the last century. Natural gas had to wait some time before it made it as a major energy and industrial feedstock commodity. The move beyond the early stages of short distance, transporta of short distance transportation, gas had to wait for steel and compressor technology to develop. To bridge, every, to bridge very long distance, gas had to wait again for the development of low-cost liquefaction and specialized sea transportation. Today's surge in gas utilization and the ever-increasing inc ever efforts to improve technology and reduce cost are not only due to the increasing demand for energy, but also to the increased environmental concerns and awarenesses. Natural gas is a, is a fused energy source, a friend list to the environment. Its abundance quali quali qualifies it to be a reliable long-term friend. Qatar's north fields with over 900 TCF of a proven natural gas reserves is a giant by any standard. Its location, like many other huge hydrocarbon rural reserves, is distance from today's major consuming areas. Our efforts to monetize our natural gas reserve are diversifying in a way that ensures not only maximum, uh, to, maxima, to maximum and speedy utilization, but also the highest possible retain. Besides LNG exports, our plans include regional export of pipe gas and a very, and very, very, uh, variety of uh, vitrochemicals and other gas-based and, and energy-intensive industries. Our early bird approach to gas to, to, uh, to liquid conversion, GTL, is yet another first for Qatar. Our decisions to use the GTL route of monetizing our gas reserves was very well timed. Demand for high priority petroleum products coupled with the looming shortage in sophisticated refineries will give our GTL ventures an added post and momentum. In our business plans, we also look beyond our borders. Today, there are strong in incentives for energy producers to participate down the value chain to increase demand and secure markets. 
we are open to considering whatever help in market development to maintain a competitive supply positions. The widening gap between gas demand and supply in the USA will be a significant factor in the globalization of the energy industry. Besides the demand growth in the, in the mature, mature markets, especially where local supplies are depleting, there are the new markets where the rate of demand growth is only limited by lack of infrastructure. Of infrastructure. The new markets will develop, will develop much faster if suppliers were to invest down to the chain. It will be a question of time and future supply demand balances before producers find it essential to move down the chain and how far. World natural gas production or consumption is expected to more than double by, 2000, by 2030. Most of the growth in production is expected to be in developing and non-OECD countries. To achieve that, the IAA estimates the need for investment in non-OECD countries of over $1.6 trillion of year $2,000. Needless to say, most of that investment will have to be international in nature. Country risk will become an important factor in the decisions making for export pipelines, LNG, and other mega projects, and even domestic downstream projects. Political and economic instability means higher project risk, which in turn translates into the requirement of much higher return on investment. The geopolitical factors are especially important for cross-border pipelines that transit uh, third countries. There are many uncertainties and challenges we have to deal with on a global scale. This makes producer-consumers cooperation essential. The natural gas proven reserves are ample and sufficient to meet world needs for decades to come. Rewarding ventures will never have problems securing the funds required. It, it will only seek to have the right env environment for investment and operation all, all along the chain from production to consumption. Qatar is proud to have contributed to the rapid development of the gas industry over the last few years. Qatar will continue in this path, satisfying the requirements of investors and consumers, and will play its part in meeting the needs of today's world and future generations for a clean and friendly energy. A, a globalized world that is safe, secure, fair, and accommodating is all that is required even though it is too ideal and seems a long way away, we all have to work towards making it reality. Hope remains the mother of all men. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Minister Atia, if you can hear me, we have uh, just a few questions, if you're willing to answer about two or three questions from the audience. Uh, yes, I hear you, Ambassador. That's what Secretary, uh, Secretary Baker said. Could I? Absolutely. Please proceed. <laughs> yeah, I just you know, want to, to be sure, you know, Secretary uh, Baker, when he raised in his speech that uh, maybe he will see a new cartel of gas. I don't believe it. And because this is a, why? Because uh, there are a big difference between gas and oil. Oil is a very dramatic, you know, commodity. But gas, you know, the nature of agreement of gas is a long-term contract, 25 years and more. And this is it will satellite, you know. We agreed in price. We agreed in term of uh, of a long-term contract. This is why we we think very, uh, you know, strongly that he will never see a gas cartel. Minister, this is Jim Pleased I am to hear you say that. <laughs> I, uh, and, and how pleased I am to see you here by video conference and to speak to you this morning. And, 
and I remember uh, so well of the many uh, meetings we've had both uh, here in the United States and in Gutter. I thank you for participating in this conference, and all of us here were, are delighted to uh, hear you make that statement because if, uh, <clears throat> if you're not going to be a part of it, it probably won't work. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry, you know, not to be physical, you know, uh, <laughs> to your, uh, you know, uh, respect, Mr. Stu. I've been there twice. I'm very proud to be, you know, twice as a physical and, one, and the third one through a satellite. Okay, Ambassador, I will be happy to answer any question. One question, Mr. The gas exporting countries forum play in the world gas markets in the com coming years. Oh, the gas is just you know to have you know some ideas, technology, uh, trying you know to see you know how some formations, how we to, can we develop and reduce the cost of uh, you know gas. Uh, we never you know discuss you know what we should you know that the the forum will not convert it by. But, you know, I can assure you it will not converting as an organization. It will involve in production, cut production, or balance production. Because, as I said before, gas nature contract is a long-term contract, is a take and pay, and cannot be, you know, and you cannot change, you know, your, you know, your uh, conditions uh, through this long-term contract. Thank you, Mr. Mr. How do you see Qatar utilizing the spot LNG market as it becomes larger? You know, just, uh, just to mention what you know, uh, Qatar will uh, will uh, uh, Qatar rule in the LNG market. Qatar today today is producing 18 million tons. Our main market today is Japan, Korea, India, and Spain. We are going, you know, to add another five million tons by next April and another 4 million tons by uh, the f uh, early 2006. Our total production will be in 2006, 28 million tons. Uh, but with, with other confirmed you know, contracts as uh, Italy, as UK, as USA, and uh, as Belgium and others, we will reach 70 million tons by 2010. That, that means Qatar will be the biggest LNG, uh, you know, uh, producers in the world, where today is, is uh, Indonesia with 25 million tons. And I think by 2006, you know, Qatar will be the biggest, but in, 2000, uh, in 2010, we will be more and more, you know, uh, you know, uh, bigger, you know, more and more bigger. And, but all this contract is a long-term contract, you know. Sport market, is, you know, we are in the sport market, but in, we don't want to convert our long-term contract to sport market. We believe that the sport market uh, it, it can, can, can be, uh, that's why they call it excess production. But what, when I meant, you know, that we will be at 70 million ton producers by 2010, all this contract is a long-term contract. Excellent, thank you. Question, Mr. Minister, would you care to comment about problems companies are facing citing LNG receiving terminals in the United States? Oh, I think, you know, I already had two uh, contracts with ExxonMobil, 15.7 million tons, and 7.5 with uh, ConocoPhillips. Totally will be more than 23 million tons. So possibly we will be start, you know, supplying this big quantity by 2008. Yes, you know, we're seeing that, you know, uh, terminals is becoming a fashionable in the United States. We heard hundreds of hundreds of terminals. Everybody wants to uh, to build the terminals, and but you know today we are we, we are very careful. You know now we are because we are investing also in the terminals in the United States with ExxonMobil and with ConocoPhillips. It's an integrated project from downstream to upstream to shipping and to terminals, and we hopefully that you know. Uh, because today, you know, what will happen, you know, we believe that the United States, they need a lot of gas, but uh, not in my backyard. This is, you know, another, you know, a big, uh, a big question, you know, that I have no answer to it. And we are wor working very hard, you know, with, through with our partners, ExxonMobil and Kenoko Phillips, to solve this problem, to, you know, to be sure that the terminal will be in 2008 are ready to receive the gas from Qatar. And we hopefully that uh, this problem could be solved. Uh, yes, it's becoming, you know, uh, 
it's a lot of question and everybody now to be the, want to be a built a terminal everybody want to be in the business but we, uh, in the end of the day i believe that it will be only a limit serious you know terminal in the united states thank you very much mr minister and we look forward to welcoming you as you said physically once again at the baker institute thank you thank you very much Mr. I would now like to uh, make some remarks to open up our plenary session. Uh, this conference marks an important milestone for the Baker Institute. Since our founding in 1993, the Institute has placed energy policy at the very top of our research agenda. A series of well-received Institute studies have focused on the Middle East, the Caspian Basin, China, Brazil, Japan, and Russia with the goal of understanding how regional, political, social, and economic forces affect global energy supply. We have also investigated the potential of path-breaking new technologies in meeting growing world demand, and we have participated in efforts, notably a task force co-sponsored with the Council on Foreign Relations, aimed at forging a national consensus on a comprehensive and effective energy policy. Today, in partnership with Stanford's Program on Energy and Sustainable Development, we are unveiling an ambitious, admittedly ambitious new endeavor, already two years in the making, to assess the future development of international natural gas, international natural gas markets. Uh, the subject, as our speakers have indicated, could not be timelier. Here in the United States, rising prices and increased market volatility have put energy back into the news. Continuing instability in the Middle East has prompted renewed discussion of our energy dependence on that troubled region and the heightened salience of the terrorist threat in the wake of the terrible attacks of September 11, 2001 has raised new and troubling questions about the security of oil and gas facilities and pipelines. Of course, these are not just U.S. but global concerns. Indeed, several overarching themes have shaped our project. The first is the increasingly central role of natural gas in the global economy. Natural gas, the cleanest and most efficient of the major hydrocarbon fuels, will play a critical part in meeting rising world energy demand, especially for electricity. While we tend to focus on its expanded role in developed countries and emerging economic giants like China and India, we should not forget that natural gas will be crucial in bringing electricity to the billion people, mostly in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, who still have no access to it. Let me add that providing electricity is not just key to breaking the cycle of poverty in these regions. It also possesses significant, if often overlooked, health benefits. As many as two million women and children die prematurely each year from indoor air pollution associated with the traditional biomass fuels. A second theme is the emerging shift from a gas world of previously regionally distinct markets to an internationally driven interdependent market of global gas. A series of developments, increasing demand, technological advances, and market liberalization are spurring integration of natural gas markets. Here in the United States, we are already familiar with the importance of imported supplies from Canadian cross-border pipelines and via LNG tankers. European markets are also served by a combination of key pipeline suppliers, uh, notably Russia and Algeria uh, and LNG. Increasingly, declining prices in the production and transportation of LNG have dramatically increased its share in world natural trade. Indeed, the revolution in LNG raises the possibility of truly integrated global spot market in natural gas, much like that in petroleum today. Such a market, let me stress, is not going to appear overnight, but already disruptions in gas supplies in one place are affecting natural gas movements elsewhere. We have seen examples of this over the past years with unrest in Indonesia and the recent uh, explosion in Algeria. The outlines of a fully integrated natural gas market are visible now. 
and this shift has potentially huge consequences for exporting and importing countries alike. Finally, the impetus for this study comes from the conviction that the geopolitical importance of natural gas is on the rise. As natural gas becomes a larger component of the energy mix of industrialized nations and developing nations alike, questions of security of supply will emerge. Such questions will shape the policies of major consuming countries and, re and regions, the United States, Western Europe, Japan, and increasingly China, towards large natural gas producers in the Middle East, Russia, Central Asia, and elsewhere. Not least, domestic developments in gas exporting countries and regions will have an increasing impact on the broader world economy. In a world of fully integrated natural gas markets, for instance, as our study will show, Japan will have a vested interest in stability of Bolivian gas reaching the U.S. West Coast. The United States will have to be concerned about natural gas policy in Africa and Russia, and the EU will be compelled to monitor the political situation in gas-producing countries as remote as Venezuela. In short, while the ongoing integration of world natural gas markets will produce clear economic benefits, it will also raise a host of complex and difficult geopolitical questions. This conference does not pretend to answer or try to answer all these questions, but it does, I believe, mark an important step in addressing a subject, the future of natural gas markets, with vast economic and geopolitical consequences for the United States and for the world. We've already made a good start with the informed and insightful presentations of Minister Atia and James Mulva. And I look forward to our busy schedule of speakers and panels for the balance of today and tomorrow. Secretary Baker has already thanked the many donors whose generosity has made this project and conference possible. I would like to second him and add a special note of gratitude to the members of the Institute's Energy Forum, whose unstinting and sustained support has helped propel our energy program to be the very forefront of our national policy debate. I also want to express my personal appreciation again to David Victor, Amy Jaffe, their staff and the researchers, the Baker Institute staff, scholars and industry experts alike who have made this conference possible. Without them, we quite literally would not be here today. Let me conclude on a general note. From our founding, the mission of the Baker Institute has been to bridge the divide between theory and practice of public policy. We have done so consistently by drawing together experts from academia, government, and business in an effort to understand and address the underlying forces shaping our world. In a very real sense, this conference, a collaborative effort between Rice and Stanford and our energy forum companies who provided advice and insight to our modeling effort from start to finish embodies that mission. And we are honored that you and the audience have taken time in your I know very busy schedules to join us as we discuss the subject, the future of natural gas markets that will shape the global economy and geopolitics for years to come. We thank you very much. <clears throat>Well, I thank you all very much. We are going to take a 15-minute break and then come back for our, our key opening uh, plenary. So please, we'll uh, see you in 15 minutes.